Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Most of the things I talk about are literally out of this world, but Ingenuity, the helicopter on Mars, is metaphorically out of this world. It has been blowing people's minds watching it fly for the last couple of months. Now, it's just uh, completed its sixth flight, and moreover, it has transitioned from being a technology demonstrator to now trying to demonstrate operational use in a mission. And the most recent flight suffered some extreme stability issues as a bug was found in the onboard software. These video frames are from the onboard navigation camera and you can see the vehicle oscillating back and forth. Now, it was able to maintain control, it used a bit more power, but it did eventually reach the landing site and safely touch down for future flights. And so this is roughly the state that we have today. You can see the red line shows the flight path that the Ingenuity helicopter has taken, whereas the white line is the path that the Perseverance has taken. So the blue dotted line area is where the initial test flights were supposed to occur, but first the rover had to deploy it, and it scouted the area, found a location, and then the deployment required that it had to drop uh, this container that was on the bottom. It was basically uh, you know, to protect the uh, helicopter as they were trying to find a location. Then the helicopter sort of folded up on its side there, and it deploys, well, it's animated. You can actually see it through a series of images. Finally, on the surface, it gets cut loose. It's held by the very top of those rotor blades. In fact, the entire structure is built around a, a vertical shaft. Everything is ultimately mounted back onto this shaft. Indeed, there's this image of a very early test version, which doesn't have any of the electronics or the batteries. It just has the rotors and the main structural object. And yeah, you know, there's, there's nothing there. Everything else is anchored to this. I believe the mass of the whole thing is about 1.75 kilograms. From tip to tip, those rotors are 1.2 meters or four feet in length. And there's a pair of rotors or that rotate in opposite directions. And this really is a miniature helicopter. It has helicopter style controls. If you buy a regular consumer drone, the propellers are more or less molded plastic. They're fixed and they don't change and you control those by adjusting the motor speeds. In the case of Ingenuity, it is a proper helicopter rotor system which uses pitch control. It has uh, collective and cyclic pitch, an independent control of both sets of rotors. So if it needs to rotate in one direction or the other, it can slow down one motor and speed the other up. If it needs to rotate, it can adjust the pitch in a cyclic manner. If it needs to go up or down, it can adjust the pitch uh, overall. On top of the center rod, you've got the solar panel that provides power for the whole system. It can take days to charge up for a flight. And below the rotors, the first thing you run into is the structure supporting the landing legs and the electronics box. And you know, you might think of an electronics box as being a box that contains electronics. Well, no, this is actually a box made of electronics. It's a bunch of circuit boards that are all folded together, connected by ribbon cables to make a box. What does a box of electronics contain? It contains the batteries in the core. It turns out that batteries are probably the most temperature sensitive component. So having those in the middle protected by the electronics actually helps a little. Yeah, the electronics are sort of laid out obviously pretty logically. You know, one end you've got your battery interface board, which talks directly to the power, and the power also talks to your you know, con flight control board. And, you know, flight control, you have a processor in there that does a lot of the sort of broad logic, but there's discrete chunks of the hardware which are you're more dedicated to actual in-flight processing. There's an FPGA which does the image processing and the uh, integration of all the different sensors and commands the helicopter. I mean, a lot has been said about the amount of hardware which is commercial off-the-shelf technology here, but the FPGA, as I understand it, is a space-rated part with extra radiation hardening. The communications, by the way, uses the Zigbee standard, which is sort of a hobbyist communication standard, but it's worked very well. The sensor package includes a navigation camera, which is relatively low resolution. It's monochrome and it more or less looks straight down. But then there's a return to earth camera, which is like 12 megapixels and full color. And that took this rather splendid image. And it's actually sort of fortuitous that we got this image because 
Normally, the Return to Earth camera looks more or less at the ground, but because of the oscillations, the vehicle was you know, had raised its front up far enough that it could see the edge of the crater in the distance. I mean, for reference, on the left there, you can see a sort of metallic sphere. That is one of the feet, and if you think about it, that should be below where the camera is. So because this was a technology demonstrator, it had a pretty low bar for demonstrating success. And they achieved this very early. They took off, they rose a couple of meters, and they rotated. They showed that they could actually hover in the atmosphere of Mars. And then they expanded the envelope. They went higher to about five meters, and there was also a traverse of a few meters and return to the landing site. I mean, it's pretty cool that they could demonstrate hovering in what the human body would consider to be a vacuum, but it does help that it had one third atmosphere of pressure. The third flight was where they really started to demonstrate the traverse capabilities, ascended to five meters and then headed 50 meters north and then headed 50 meters south back to its landing site uh, to perform a touchdown in more or less the same place. The helicopter flew at a speed of about 2 meters per second and the total time in the air was about 1 minute and 20 seconds. And during this flight it also was going to use its onboard cameras to collect, to collect images and send those back. And in one of those we actually got a picture of the rover in the top left corner, albeit a very small distant grainy image. And that would have been an amazing way to cap off this mission because with these three flights, they had successfully done everything that they were required to do because this was a technology demonstrator program. There was no notion that it would be really doing anything else beyond demonstrating the tech. But the plan had been that Perseverance would head off and do its own thing, leaving Ingenuity behind. And without Perseverance, there was no way for Ingenuity to talk back to the Earth and have a further mission. But it turns out that the area they'd landed in was interesting enough that the geologists actually wanted samples. So that gave the Ingenuity team more time to work with their little baby and you basically demonstrate its capabilities as a mission asset. The first thing they wanted to do was on flight four, try to scout a new landing location. That meant flying out about 80 meters and then coming back after taking photographs. But this also gave the rover a chance to do something it hadn't done before and that was record video and audio at the same time of this. And so, you know, this is incredibly hard to hear, but I'm gonna boost the volume a little. Okay, so sure, that audio sounds like, you know, the warp drive on the Enterprise or something. It's rather underwhelming, except for the fact that it's coming from the planet Mars. I mean, not only is this helicopter flying on Mars and the data is being recorded on Mars, but we're hearing the sound, even though there's almost no atmosphere on Mars, there's just enough to carry the sound of these motors working really hard in that thin air to keep this thing airborne. Incidentally, you know, one of the things that constrains how long they can stay in the air isn't the amount of battery power. It's how hot those motors get, because without a thick atmosphere around them, it's very hard of them to get rid of the heat they generate while operating. The temperature of the motors apparently rises by about one degree centigrade every second. Anyway, speaking of the thin atmosphere, there's another thing that you can catch in this video that's been processed by Andrea Plesch. Uh, you can see a cloud of dust getting kicked up underneath the vehicle as it passes over, right? I'm bouncing it back and forth, and it's just barely visible. In fact, I'm so sure YouTube is going to destroy it. This is an enhanced version. What you do is you take a fixed frame and you subtract it from every single other frame and you basically take that difference, blur it a little so that you can actually see the clouds. Uh, this is the landing, right? You see the clouds getting blown up and then dissipating. 
But for the operations team, this flight was all about finding a new landing site, and it flew the distance, it used its navigation cameras, and it took a bunch of pictures, and it I indeed identified that the site was good, it looked clear. Now, they can look at it from orbit and say, that looks clear, but when you get up close, you never know whether there will be something that is big enough to threaten a small helicopter like this, but small enough to not be visible from orbit. So that flight went off without hitch, but most interestingly, in the landing, just look in the background, there's a dust devil on the right-hand side, and there's one slightly to the left of that. Now, the helicopter's going to come in uh, in a minute, and very near to where it lands, there's going to be another dust devil appearing. So that's like three dust devils caught in the same frame sequence because they were recording a helicopter. See the dust devil coming across right behind that helicopter? Totally unrelated phenomena in the background. And so that flight was on May 7th. Now, the next thing they wanted to do for operational demonstration was to show that they could fly and scout a site and land at it in a same flight. So that is what the plan was for May 22nd. And that's the flight path that they followed, except there was a problem. Again, this is the video sequence from the navigation cameras showing it wobbling all over the place as it tried to control itself. Now, as I said, those rotors are able to adjust their pitch to control the vehicle, but they're controlled by a computer, and the computer also gets information on the vehicle's attitude from the inertial measurement units. These are little gyroscopes and accelerometers that detect the vehicle attitude. The problem is, these are very similar to the kind of devices you might find on a cell phone, which are great for doing things like augmented reality, so you can play Pokemon Go, but their accuracy isn't great, so they need to be regularly corrected, and they do get these corrections by using the navigation camera. This is a video from, Na from Flight 2, and you can see the green spots that it's finding in the terrain that it's using to to uh, adjust its internal reference for where it is. So these images come in at specific times and it compares against the previous time and that's how it's measuring its motion. Due to a glitch, they missed one frame and then every subsequent frame got delivered with the timestamp off by one frame. And that meant that their control data was lagging their actual flight data. And you know that can make things very hard. If you've ever had control lag in a video game, you'll know that it can be very hard to control something. And you know, sometimes you can learn to account for the control lag, but if the lag changes, then your entire model for reacting to the stimuli and then generating the correct inputs goes out the window and you need to relearn it. And that's what's happened here. Thankfully, they had sufficient margin to maintain control. Uh, the downside was that because they were adjusting the pitch on the rotors more than they expected, they ended up using a lot more power and that, of course, impacts a potential flight time. And then for the final landing, once they've picked their spot, they turned off the camera navigation and entirely relied on the IMU and the LiDAR to get them down safely to the surface. So hoping that problem doesn't affect them in the future, or maybe they can rectify it, but uh, it'd be nice to see them flying again. Uh, I heard that the link that they're getting, the Zigbee uh, connectivity with the rover, is better than they expected, so they think they've got better range. And that really translates into having more time to let the rover do its thing before they need to move to catch up with it. And you know, Perseverance has a long journey ahead of it. I hope that Lil Chopper can keep it company for as long as possible. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.